Hey y'all, welcome to The Clock Tower. I'm Colton, here with Brandon. We've got some BCS stuff to catch up on, as well as, of course, the new ban list. We definitely have some thoughts on that. We'll get through BCF first. Starting in Germany, Askigura takes the win, followed by a pair of Shizumirin Slime 8 Pants lists in second and third. And Overlord gets its fourth top of the season on Salvage Bar. I don't think there's anything too crazy here. Nothing unexpected. There is an AOT in top eight as well. Salvage choice. Mid-sized regional, 87 players. The Europe meta is always a little bit different, but this seems pretty par for the course. Yeah, definitely a lot of slime here, what we were expecting to see. We did get in top eight a standby pants slime. Realistically, trying to get the Bakru Shuna in play early. Power line threshold going with the stock charging and then just be able to turn that stock into useful tools later in the game, which I think is actually really interesting. So just being yep. able to see, even th with that list, that list would bypass the ban list coming up. Yeah, and then we'll, we'll talk more about that later, uh, what people might do in response to how Slime got hit on that ban list. Uh, the other interesting list here, Chloe Marine, again, just throw two good combos together in Hollow Live and you have a deck. So it's an eight salvage list with the level one Chloe that resonates with the Laplace into the Marine. So we've seen this kind of list before. I'm starting to take off a little bit more, finding new and creative ways to use the Hollow X package specifically. But that's not the only top we've seen with Marine that weekend, right? No, it is not. Because in Houston, the winning list, Kanata Marine, a bit of a throwback to a previous time. This list is very much just old-fashioned Kanata Marine. It has a couple extra pieces from the new stuff, but it's very much just the list as it's always kind of been in a lot of ways. I mean, good stuff is good. And Marine closes from 3-0, right? And I think that if you can get the extra CX down at some point in the first half of the game, if you can rush some damage early on with this Kanata Marine list, and you do see extra soul triggers in here, right? Because you see two copies of the, the Ina CX swap. Right, So this list can run 27 triggers, and that allows it to push that little bit of extra damage, maybe push the opponent into two in deck one before refresh, get them into a position where they can eat some more of that damage in the second half of the game. If you can put your opponent into 3-0 and not die, this is the Gura strategy in a lot of ways, right? Or this is, you know, there are a lot of decks that are playing this kind of rush your opponent into 3-0, but I'm still down here at 2 one 2, two. you can't close me. So I think that's the plan here, and I think it works, because Maureen closes from 3-0 as well as any deck we've ever seen in English. Lots of sword art, four different sword arts in top eight, three Kiritos, and a Silica. But of course, the most interesting deck in top eight is this Darkness list. Oh my gosh, Konosuba, finishing fourth at an event like it's 2019. Right? Being able to see first Konosuba top of the season... Also likely the last Kono Tuba top of the season. Being able to string together a list that's able to crack some boards. Pairing in with this Cosma event, the Lurk skill, being able to pump up adventure characters or goddess characters by 2,500 power and hexproof is not definitely something of pairing with that kind of darkness that comes down early to be able to crack boards and uh, being able to deny defensive tools against it. Mm -hmm. So being able to play down that darkness and deny the anti-change counter mm -hmm. against it. So it kind of like wins board and stays alive during your own turn. Yeah. And, you know, because the, the darkness package, for those unfamiliar, it's a level one combo on wind that gets the specific pieces you need to merge. It's a two one and a level zero. They merge together to bring on the level three darkness for one stock at level two and it's a cantrip. It's top check three, add one. So ideally, you're getting two of these darknesses on board early. You also run three copies of the uh, Mesmerizing Water Goddess, kind of the OG stock healer. So you have these really good tools that plus you a lot of resources for not a lot of investment, but you have to play the package. The cost on this is that you have to play the package. The package is fine. But getting that plus and getting that board, especially if you can get the 2 1 Aqua down behind them, that also allows you to kick things away when you get reverses. You play a copy of the 3K Memory Kick. 
this list really does hold board against big things. And now that it's got the hexproof event on it as well, you can't break it with an anti-change counter, which is one of the things that Darkness really dies to, is that anti-change counter. Now, you just don't for a free event. It's really interesting. I I like it. It finds a, a path against its toughest matchups, against Slime and against Alice, stuff that's really prominent in the meta, and it just bullies the board against basically everything else. Biggest weakness is the top end. It's always the top end yeah. with Darkness. Like, that's always the issue is that as much as that merge package, you know, because the merge package also it has the cancel burn. On attack cancel burn and on defense cancel burn. So you have a little bit of extra damage push, but you don't have that, like, closing top end. But again, if you can bully on the board, if you can deprive your opponent of resources because they don't win board index that really want to, you can create some advantage and make it so that they don't have all of their top end as well, just because you deny them the board plus that allows them to keep the hand, that allows them to play their massive wombo combo at level 3 to kill you from the middle of level 2. So, I like this. This is really fun. As someone who really likes Konosuba as a set, it's one of my favorite sets, uh, just because of the weird deck building stuff you get to do with it. And I love seeing an obscure piece that everyone forgets about, just finding its way in and you also see the stock swap event and the fumio so there's a lot of disruption here i really like this i'm a big fan i don't think it's like super meta don't get me wrong it's definitely a niche deck played by someone who knew how to pilot it i don't think konosuba is going to suddenly become super relevant but there is a path for konosuba if you want to invest in it and i think this is a really fun deck outside of that we saw avatar make its way uh into top eight as well that kind of bar standby list, kind of what we've been expecting to see with that Sokka, as well as another slime. You and I were at this event, and we both scrubbed out. Yes, we did. I went 2-2, two and two. I got Gurud from 2-2, two two, and then um, Ainz canceled five times in deck one. Like, nothing you can do if your opponent cancels five times in deck one, nothing you can do if you just eat 12 damage and die from a, from a, from a double Gura board. It just happens. That's the game. Uh, I also died from Double Gura from 2-2. Seven clean on the top. That just is yep. enough. Um, mm -hmm. Yep, that'll do it. And then um, I also... I did get one win of the day. Yeah. <laughs> I played Connor round two, and his deck lost him the game. My deck lost me round one. His deck lost him round two. And then round three, I was always... Yeah. I was just one card behind the whole game. Yeah. My, I was playing Alice. I didn't get my Brainstormer to spawn Alice. Yeah. Because it was at the bottom of yeah. the deck kind of stuff. It was just... When Alice whiffs, Alice whiffs hard. Like, so. there's just no getting around that. I was on Choice Pants, Hollow Live. I got one win. I beat uh, Roshan, actually, on Slime. I paired it in for the second event in a row, which feels bad. We're pairing into, you know, a really good player in round three. So at that point, that game's just a coin flip, right? Because, like, when you get two players who know what they're doing against each other playing meta decks, it's just like... Okay, you know, whoever who who get who whose stuff pops off and my stuff popped off and I got the dub. So I ended up 2 2 on the day. Like, it is what it is. I had a great season. I'm not disappointed in my season overall, like plenty of good results over the course of the year. Like, I achieved my goals for the season for sure. So no disappointments. Um, like obviously it didn't end as as I wanted to. I wanted to make a push for top in Houston, but sometimes events don't go your way. It is what it is. Not unhappy with my season at all, though. Very happy with how I played this year. I feel like I developed a lot as a player. And I'm looking forward to not having to think about playing meta for six months. That's going to be great. Moving on to Mexico. We don't have all of top eight for Mexico, but we do have top four for sure. 2-1-2 two, two dead on a Quince 8 standby list that plays all three of the standby combos at 1, 2, and 3. I really like this deck building strategy. Where you go, I am going to find a way to make the maximum value version of this build work. 8 Standby Quince has been fine. It's been good. It hasn't been super dominant. But the ceiling has always been super high if you're willing to commit to trying to find a way to get the value out of all three of these combos. We haven't really seen a lot of people attempt that yet, but I really like the approach of trying to max out what your deck can do and then figuring it out from there. Like, this is the end goal. We're going to play all three of these combos. How do I make it work so that I can get maximum value? And that's what this deck does. And I think that's what sets it apart from these other eight standby quince lists. This might be 
the way to play eight standby quints in the future solving the eight standby quints three combo problem like which combo do you play you play all three of them if you can find a way to play all three of them if this solves that problem this is the quints eight standby list of the future uh rounding out the rest of top four is slime and slime and still slime lots of slime we'll, we'll, we'll talk about slime more so azure lane at its first major where it can be played gets a top with the list that everyone is kind of eyeing with some equal measure disdain and curiosity, I think. And it's just the two soul rush deck. It's just throwing soul at the board. It, it said, oh, damage meta? Bet. We're going to go full damage meta. Here you go. I'm going to swing at you for four in each lane at level zero. And you're going to just eat it because you're in deck one. Azure Lane is the end result of the damage wins games line of thought. It's just the natural end point, the natural progression of where a damage meta will take you. And that is slamming two souls on the board, triggering two soul every time you trigger a CX, getting two souls down at zero, and just throwing as much damage as you possibly can at your opponent and saying there's no way you can survive all of this. This is very much the Area 51 raid. Let's see them aliens. They can't shoot all of us. That's Azure Lane. It's crazy. And I don't know if I love it or hate it, honestly. It has, like, no subtlety. I don't think that Azure Lane is going to, like, destroy the meta or anything like that. I'm not looking at this going, you know, that th this deck in particular is, th is the dangerous thing that's going to upend the game. But, man... This is, this is a dangerous path to walk, Bushy Road. Gotta be careful if you're gonna let people have turn one level zero turbo aggro. If you're gonna let people have this, if you put this in a better package that can actually like win board and has, you know, a really good top end, this deck doesn't even run a top end. Its top end is throwing soul triggers at the board. It's gonna get out of control fast if you, if you let this go unchecked, this design space. Just please be careful. They've been a little more a little more cautious in the last few releases. The last few releases in English have been pretty vanilla, and it slowed down the progression of the meta. Whereas, like, it felt like for six months we were just gonna have you know banger on banger for sets, like all these really really powerful sets coming out one on top of the other that just shoved the meta into a new era. And now it feels like for the last several months it started to slow down with the new releases not really changing anything since you know the end of Spring Fest. So, and without, you know, a whole lot of other stuff coming up in the next few months, it's probably going to change the meta that much more. Maybe we're in a place where the meta is slowing down, which is probably a good thing, but I'm scared of, I'm scared of all these, all these two soul triggers. That scares me a little bit. Uh, speaking of releases, we have some new ones coming out. We do. Um, let's get through those real quick. Nothing changed in terms of announcements for what is being released. We just have some dates. The two Mang Dream things... The Countdown Collection and the MyGo Trial Deck are coming out April 19th. Also coming out April 19th, Psychano 3, the movie set. So we have dates for those. We still do not have dates for Dengeki Bunko, Bochi the Rock, or Ruby Premium, which we anticipate is the English exclusive that will come out during the summer. So we kind of know what's going to happen through the middle of 2024, uh, even though we don't have dates beyond April, but that's the only update on the release schedule. Now for the good stuff. They announced this was happening early November, a couple days ago. They put out what the list was actually going to be. Three restrictions. Restriction one, Sword Art Online. The 2-1 Alice combo, limited to two copies, much like the Kurami top end in Dal, not banned, limited to two. Slime, choose one of two between the Shizu level one and the Mirin level two in that eight pants build. That's been probably the best build best deck in terms of representation and results this BCS season. And then finally, a little tweak to Seven Deadly Sins. Instead of taking the Ricky and making it restricted with the Gil level 3, they have replaced that with the Escanor combo itself to free up that Ricky to be played in other decks. So alongside this restriction list update, they also released essentially an explanation where they told us why they made the decisions that they made. We will start with the three additions they made to the ban list. Sword Art, 
they talk about how over 20% of players going X2 and over 20% of players converting to top eight. Those are the metrics that we use when we talk about if a deck is good or not. You and I, mm-hmm. like specifically, when we look back over seasons and we look at those spreadsheets from Rumble and Springfest that, you know, that we try to put together as best we can, like Alexander's data and all that, as much as possible, we're looking at X2 and we're looking at conversion rate to top eight. Alice had very high numbers in both of those categories. That's why they hit it. If there's going to be a reason to hit something, it should be based on those kinds of results. And it's good to see that Bushy Road, like, explaining that those results are their primary motivator for making these restrictions is a very welcome sight. Again, I think you could unrestrict everything in this meta and we would have a balanced meta. But in terms of motivation for banning things, if you're going to ban something, at least ban it for the right reasons. And they did so with this Alice ban. Having a reason for the bans, I think, is a very helpful tool to help explain to both players and um, just kind of motivators what things help prompt the desire to put a ban list out there. Not just necessarily outcry of players, but there's actually a well-reasoned yep. approach to it. And we'll put a pin in that real quick. We'll, we'll come to that, back to that in a second. For the slime restriction, they restricted level 1 and level 2 combos. Again, high X2 rate, high conversion rate were their reasons. The other reason that I think is interesting here... With Sword Art getting a hit to its consistency, they didn't want to signal too much freedom for Slime either. They recognize that those two archetypes are very similar. Big level 2's down, that combo, and plus your resources. Granted, the Slime one doesn't come down till level 2, so it's definitely more fair in, you know, TCG parlance than the Alice that comes down at 1. But they wanted to restrict this archetype, and they also wanted to give other decks within Slime, which is still a new set, more of an opportunity to get played because everyone was playing eight pants and no one was playing any of the other stuff. Again, they're doing this because of high win rate and high conversion rate, which Slime has. Slime's been the most successful deck in all of BCS. And they're doing it because they want to restrict, they want to limit at least this archetype that players, frankly, have been complaining about, the, the big level twos that they can't really step over. So I get this one. I, th- this one, I, I understand. I, I track why they're doing this in this current environment. Kind of with that same note, when we look at the Seven Deadly Sins and their explanation there, um, they mentioned that how it the previous restriction had actually fulfilled the intended effect and then list the endless results of where it's at currently with that. About 10% of players receiving uh, X2 with Seven Deadly Sins. So the Gil Thunder, the level 3, it top checks to make sure that you know, you know where your triggers are going to be and bounces a character, which gives the Escanor more soul and less interaction in its lane. So players are using that as a way to really make the Escanor top end work, because then you could swing massive, massive numbers with the Escanor, find, you know, a two soul trigger in the top three cards, you know, make sure that you're swinging with the Escanor in the correct lane at the right time, so that it's burning for one six times, which is the goal with Escanor. Like, that's what you're trying to get a million burn ones. They initially restricted it alongside the Ricky that enables the Escanor rather than the Escanor itself. So they remove the Ricky and replace it with the Escanor. This change makes a lot of sense. Like this change makes a lot of sense, given the goals. And like you were saying, they say that the goal for the SDS restriction worked. They wanted to bring its representation down, and they wanted to bring its X2 rate down, which it did. They want to create a balanced environment. At least that's the implication. They want to create a balanced environment. And now SDS only has about a 10% X2 rate, because it maintains the restriction on Escanor a little bit, but it also frees up the Ricky to be available in other decks. So I get that. I get that change. We haven't talked about the other change yet. The other change is that MTI is finally free. You can play the tap counter with the Ghislaine. MTI hasn't done anything since like Rumble. Even unrestricted MTI is not that dangerous right now, giving it its ability to fight Gura and to fight Escanor is really good. Like, giving it its tool that at least allows it to have some kind of counter to the extremely powerful damage top ends that we see in the meta right now, it makes MTI so much more playable. It does, and I don't think it's going to take anything back from it, too. We saw Mm -hmm. this change happen with the JP ban list come through with the unbanning of this, and it's still not dominating in that JP sphere. So... It's not a surprise to see this come off. 
Um, well, so what we'll do is we'll look at the ban list as a whole, and then we'll come back, we'll kind of circle back to these specific changes and talk about maybe what kind of effect that'll have going forward. So restriction list as a whole, we have these changes. Hololive still has its IMA restriction. We're putting a pin in that too. The, the, the Hololive conversation, don't you worry. We're coming back to that. Um, we got two pins currently, if anyone's keeping track. Quint still has its restriction. Kermy still restricted to two. Dal still has its blue package restricted um, for the 2-2 the two -two standby package. All the associated pieces that go along with it were still, restri still restricted. Kaguya still has to choose one of two. Um, and then we have like the misprint kind of awkward things that are technically on the ban list, like Batman, Ninja, and Fate, which those are not bans as much as they're clarifications of, you know, make sure the cards are played as they were intended to be played. All right. So, pulling out pin number one, why is Kaguya still on the ban list? Like, this ban list is the least egregious ban list possible. As someone who does not like the ban list on principle, why is Kaguya of all things on this list? Come on, guys. Like, Kaguya hasn't done anything in months. Hashtag free Kaguya. But whatever. That's pin number one. Pin number two. Hollow Live dodges the ban. Eins dodges the ban. And this is the part where I potentially upset some people. That's a good thing. Neither of these decks, Gura or Eins, deserves a ban. They've indicated that they're keeping an eye on the Sharks and the Goats. And I would argue that for the Shark, it makes sense to at least be paying attention and monitoring it for a potential future ban. I don't think Eins falls in that category. We'll come back to that in a second. We'll start with Gura. If you look back over this season, what has Gura done? to deserve a ban or a restriction. Didn't top in Mexico, didn't top in Houston, one top in Germany, it won the event, no tops in British Columbia, it finished third in the Netherlands, two tops in Sydney, including third place, but nothing in New York, one top in Chicago. Like this is not dominant. This is not a dominant deck. <laughs> at all. It has one event win and a handful of tops. It is a good deck. It is a top five deck, but it is not doing anything to deserve being banned. The deck has weaknesses, especially the standby list. If it triggers twice, it just gets rushed. Like Gura is super susceptible to just eating damage and dying. It doesn't have mill and it doesn't have compression. Like it's very easy to double Ame and get rid of two of your climaxes, and then you just eat nine on the next turn, and you maybe don't even get to Gura. And I think a lot of people sat across from Gura at their locals, or even in regionals, and they died from 2-3 two, or 2-2 two, two one time. They got upset and said, I don't like that deck, it's toxic because it kills me from 2-2 two, two sometimes. Yeah, it does. It absolutely does. But there are other decks that can do that sort of thing too, and those decks don't get called out because they don't get played. Because those kinds of decks are inherently high risk, high reward. The Gura's just not consistent enough. People play it. It's got a lot of representation. You can't throw a stick without hitting a Gura list at a regional event. And it's not getting that kind of results. And I think that there are some players who need to recognize that just because it has the ability to do something super powerful does not inherently mean that it's going to do that all the time or that it's going to do that with enough consistency. You don't have to like it, but just because you don't like an archetype doesn't mean that it deserves to be banned. The second deck that people have been clamoring for a ban for is the Eins list, which, I mean, same argument. Eins has done even less than Gura. Eins finished fourth in Germany, it topped in BC. It won an event that it technically wasn't supposed to be played at in Costa Rica. And it got a top in New York. That's it for the whole season. That is nowhere near enough for a ban. Just based on its results and based on what it is weak to, which is damage rush, which is what a lot of the best decks are good at. I don't see any reason to restrict Eins at this point. And if anything, the fact that Bushiroad opted to go with a light touch for this ban list, relatively speaking, instead of the sweeping ban that we saw in JP that, like, nuked the meta back two years, is probably the better result. Because if they had nuked Eins, Gura, Slime, and Alice, 
all in the same list. Then we would just have a quince meta for the next six months. Like, worlds would be nothing but quince and a couple of avatar players. Like, that would be the meta. And, you know, some people trying to experiment with different Hololive stuff. Like, because Hololive still has a bunch of other lists that are decent. But unless you want a one-deck quince meta or a one-set quince meta with a handful of other things, this ban list, probably the best-case scenario. They're nearly good. They are influential. They determine some decisions that you make when you're building your deck. You have to prepare for those matchups, but they are not unhealthy for the meta right now. And if that changes, then fine. I would understand it. But neither of those decks have done anything to deserve that as of right now. So yeah, that's the ban list. Complete ban list. Obviously, link in the description if you want to see everything. We'll link to the explanation document as well. They seem to think that Guilty Gear is going to be a powerful set. I don't know, man. Like, we'll see if Guilty Gear is a powerful set. Do you know where maybe someone can have a look at some of those Guilty Gear cards as they're being released? Did you, have you seen any of the new Guilty Gear cards? A Zato Milia package, maybe? Like, on bar? You, uh, you see that anywhere? Maybe. Okay. Maybe. All right, all right. Maybe. Yeah. So we'll see what Guilty Gear does. We haven't seen enough of Guilty Gear to know if it's going to be meta-relevant or not, but set reveals are happening all over the place. Also, really cool that Bushy Road like, gave a lot of those card reveals to Weiss people, specifically across the uh, the Weiss internet space. It's kind of cool getting to see people that, you know, you like and respect get to do card reveals across the board. And obviously we got to do some as well, which is pretty sweet. All right. I think that's it for us. We'll be back on Thursday with gameplay for Ari Ferreta because that deck is out. That toxic mess. Love that level one combo, though. It's really fun. We'll play that game on Thursday. Please like, share, comment, subscribe, and have a good one. We'll see you then.